Facebook. I'm here on my Liberated Voice page and I'm delighted to be talking to you today about um, the really significant paradigm shifts that I've experienced over the last couple of years and I would like to share with you um, some thoughts about that. And before you, um, before I really get into this, what I would like is to invite all of you to consider something that I think is very important, which is for those of you who are singers, how did you learn to do what it is that you can do very well now? How did you learn it? I'm not expecting you to be able to answer this question quickly. Um, it's something that I think about a lot, and I've been thinking about it a lot today, but I've thought about it a lot over the years, uh, because how we learn can inform how we teach and also how we teach ourselves, both which are really important for us. Um, so. I first became interested in vocal pedagogy when uh, I realized that the way that I had been taught in grad school, three years from my master's, four years from my doctorate, total of three voice teachers who I've been working with over that period of time, and I finished without having learned to sing. Um, the way that I think about singing now, just having the freedom to express myself vocally, um, having the ability to navigate my entire range and how to work on it better myself. And certainly I was not singing at a level that would have been, um, that would have facilitated me starting a career at the level that I wanted to. And so I wanted to know, you know, is there such a thing as vocal pedagogy at all? Because if there is, I didn't receive it. And so if I'm going to learn to sing and if I'm going to teach other people to sing, I need to figure out how do we learn and how do we teach? So where I'm starting with, if I think about like, how did I learn to sing well enough to get to the point where I was of interest to the graduate programs that I got into? And that's actually pretty easy to trace back. Um, I had always wanted to sing, but I just didn't have a voice that people thought was beautiful. Uh, I got a lot of attention for playing the clarinet. Nobody wanted to hear me sing. And then as I described in the preface to my first book, Complete Vocal Fitness, I had the opportunity in my early 20s to uh, participate in some body work that enabled me to breathe more fully and to relax a lot of tension that I'd had in my throat, my face, my jaw, all of my articulators. And suddenly I noticed that I was starting to be able to sing better. So being able to condition my body, I learned, helped me to be able to coordinate it, letting go of a lot of tension that I didn't even necessarily realize was there revealed an instrument that could be trained. So that's part of how I learned to sing. Um, another part of how I learned to sing uh, was that I was already a very highly trained musician. And I also had the opportunity to do my undergraduate studies at a school called Bennington College in Vermont. And at Bennington, you are exhorted to take a very creative approach to anything that you're studying. And so I was studying music. I did major in music there. Uh, but the scientists, the math majors, um, people who were working on social science projects uh, were all encouraged to take a creative, zoomed out, imaginative view um, so that we were all working on creating something fresh, whether it was a fresh perspective or creating music uh, through composition um, or other things. This was a really wonderful environment for me at the time because it was so focused on um, on just bringing your imagination to what it is that you're doing. And that, I think, is where my acting instincts, if, uh, if we can call it that, came from. Because for me, by the time um, I was the musician that I was when I started learning how to sing, I knew that it was my imagination that was getting channeled through my music. I wasn't trying to do it the way, well, we can't really escape from trying to like make the good sound that you heard somebody else make or do it the way that you heard somebody else do it because we get influences from everywhere. Um, but I knew that what I had to say was something that what I wanted to express was going to be what generated my energy. And so without really much technique, just having a freed up instrument, a musical background, and a belief that what I was saying was important got me to a level where I could sing well enough to get into um, some competitive graduate programs in singing. Um, and. In retrospect, I will tell you that I learned almost nothing from my voice teachers in grad school. And I don't wanna take a lot of time right now to kind of 
dump on grad school and, and all of that. You can read my blog if you want to know my opinions about this. It, not that it isn't important, um, but what I discovered and what you may also have noticed is that by the time you're singing well enough to get into a competitive grad school, um, teachers are assuming that they don't necessarily have to teach you technique, or even if they are, they might not notice that they haven't really thought through teaching technique in the way that I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, I feel that what constitutes pedagogy uh, at, at music schools uh, for singers often amounts to survivorship bias. What do I mean by survivorship bias? Survivorship bias means that, um, well, I worked hard and I got to the point where I can do this thing. So what worked for me so that I could work hard and learn to do this thing is going to work for you too. And if it doesn't work for you, it just means it wasn't meant to be. It means you didn't have the aptitude. It means you didn't work hard enough. Uh, conservatories really like to hire successful, amazing performers to teach singing at their schools. This is a good thing to have. We want people who can model for us what great singing is. We want mentors who understand what the business is like um, to help us understand how we can find our place in it. Uh, but we also need voice teachers who know how to teach voice. And the fact that you got to the point where you were a really wonderful singer capable of performing on the world's great stages doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be able to teach somebody else how to do what you did. Because as hopefully all of you are thinking about, I'll ask it again for those who have just joined us, how did you learn to do what you do well now? How did you learn it? Did you learn it from a teacher? Did you learn it by messing around? Did it come to you naturally? The hard work that you put in, what did it constitute? How did you learn to do what it is that you did now? And the problem is that even if I am a world-class opera singer or a world-class rock singer, and I wanna go and teach other people how to sing the way that I sing, and I might really give this question a lot of thought, how did I learn how to do what I do now? Even if I can come up with like a really clear answer, if I make the assumption that offering that to the people who I'm teaching is going to help them to become excellent in the way that they want to, um, what I'm gonna find out is that my teaching is going to work really, really well for some of my students. They're gonna get the results because they have a lot in common with me. And so their experience is gonna be similar to what mine is. But for the rest of the students in my studio, if they, they don't naturally breathe the way that I do, they don't have the other you know, tools that they're bringing to the program that I already had, for example, talking about the things that I brought to grad school, um, they didn't come naturally to me, but my musicianship and my dramatic skill, it's based on just my confidence that like I can get up and express myself. Um, not everybody's gonna come in with that. They might have to be taught it. And so if I didn't have to be taught it, I might not even notice that they need to be taught it. So that's what I'm saying about survivorship bias. You've probably noticed that um, not all singers who enroll in even very prestigious uh, master's degree programs or doctoral programs graduate with a really strong mastery of technique and the ability to like go out there and look for work and get hired. I know it's competitive, but just as a baseline of just being able to do this skill at a very professional level, I was not able to do that out of grad school. And um, I find this to be problematic. I think that we owe it to our students that we accept into these programs to keep the promise that we're going to teach them to do what they need to be able to do in order to perform didn't happen for me. And if you've noticed that it doesn't happen for absolutely everybody or even maybe a huge percentage of the people who go to school for music, um, I think a lot of it comes down to this idea that it's the teacher figured out how to sing. They're to, to the best of their ability, they're gonna teach you the way that they were taught and if it doesn't work out for you, it doesn't work out for you. Um, for me, that's not good enough as a teacher because a lot of my job satisfaction rests on knowing that my students are making progress, they're getting results, they're expressing themselves, they're getting what they came here for. And if I feel like that's not happening, um, I can't explain it away to myself with just being like, oh, I guess it wasn't meant to be. Oh, I guess they're just gonna have to work for it for another 10 years. Oh, maybe they just weren't practicing hard enough. Um, because if I am making the promise that if you come and work with me, you're gonna learn to sing, I'm gonna teach you to sing. Uh, I need to be delivering on that promise. Um, so I learned to sing 
sometime after, sometime after finishing, uh, finishing my graduate degrees, uh, I was very, very fortunate to seek out and, uh, and work with some really amazing, wonderful teachers who do have a very strong concept of pedagogy, who do understand that I'm coming to them to be trained to do things that I don't know how to do, and who feel that it's important for them to be able to communicate these procedures to all of their students. Um, there are lots of wonderful teachers like that out there, and uh, what I'm going to share today with the kind of paradigm shift that I've experienced um, will only make their skills, I think, if they're not already doing what I'm doing, which I don't know if anybody's doing what I'm doing uh, in quite the same way, it's having the right structure and having a good teaching paradigm plus a good pedagogical approach. That's what all students need. That's what all singers need. And that's what I want to talk um, about today. So um, even after I created the foundation of what now is still my pedagogy and certainly incorporated a lot of what I learned from the teachers who um, my work with them was so meaningful and informative for me, I noticed something strange, which was that my students were making progress, but it seemed to me like it was taking a lot longer than it, than it needed to. Um, and so I started paying attention to how it works. When my students are learning what's happening, and how can I make it better? So what I want to share for you with you right now is the basic content that I wanted to come on Facebook Live for, because this is what I noticed. This is what I have noticed leads to progress and, and retention in my studio. One very important thing is that for a concept or a method to make a difference, the student has to be able to validate it for themselves through experience and observation. I may be able to get you to the point where you can produce the results. Say we're, we're working on resonance and you discover that you can create this fantastic resonance space and it's consistent and you're able to sing your song and have it all be beautiful and resonant and you've got this nice warm sound that you want. Um, and you can do that in the lesson. Great. And then my expectation is that you're going to go home, you're going to practice it, you're going to come back and you will have built on that. What I found is that week after week, my students would make progress in whatever it was that we were working on, but then they would come back and I would find myself saying things over and over again. And I knew that it wasn't because they weren't paying attention, and I knew that it wasn't necessarily because they weren't you know, working on it in the way that I had asked them to. What I found out is that for you to be able to do the thing that I'm describing you have to validate for yourself what that experience is. It's not enough to just lay out, here's the concept, here's the method. If you understand the concept, right, you understand that it's possible, for example, to separate your, jo your tongue from your jaw and be able to articulate some consonant sounds and all of your vowels without moving your jaw, um, great, you've got that, con you've got that concept. Um, if you succeed in doing it in your lesson, you're able to sing um, your entire song with very minimal jaw movement and great resonance, um, that's great, you have done that and now you can go and listen to the recording of yourself doing that. But if you were just doing what I said in the moment and I'm giving you feedback, okay, do this now, do this now, and you're just following what it is that I did, uh, that I said to do, you're gonna go home, you might not be able to recreate that in yourself because what I need to facilitate for that to be permanent is for you to have the experience in real time for yourself that like, oh, it feels so much better, it sounds so much better, there's so little resistance and my voice is so much freer if I don't engage my jaw. And I can also notice whether my jaw is engaging or not. Then they've got the tools they need and they can go back and reproduce the results and practice and reinforce and habituate the movements that we did in the lesson and they're gonna have retention. So again, for a concept or a method to make a difference, the student has to validate it for themselves through experience and observation. Now, for that to happen, here's another very important thing that I think you'll all relate to. For that to happen, they need to be paying attention to the right things in real time, noticing what's going on rather than judging or analyzing it. 
This, I think, is one of the most important lessons for any of us to learn, and it's what I try to instill right from lesson one, uh, which is that when you do an exercise or you sing a phrase, just notice what happened. Just be paying attention to what happened. Now, while you're singing it, hopefully all of your energy is invested in doing the thing, doing the exercise, doing the phrase, but then you need to notice what happened. Oh, I was doing this exercise to try to let my jaw stay relaxed and I noticed that I moved my jaw. Or I wanted to move my jaw, but then I didn't. Um, that observation is really important. If instead you go right to analyzing or judging, like, oh, that didn't sound good and I think that it was because A, B, C, and D is why it didn't sound good. Or you start judging yourself, oh, that sounded terrible and it's all my fault because I moved my jaw and I wasn't supposed to move my jaw. You've missed the opportunity. You've missed the opportunity to learn something from the exercise that you just did. Because as I often tell my students, the point is never to do the exercise perfectly. The point is to form a strong intention and then notice what happens when you follow through on that intention. Because that's how we learn. If you notice, oh, I meant to let my jaw relax and engage my tongue and I did it and it was awesome, then that's great. Positive reinforcement, you're gonna do it again. Or you notice, all right, it was my intention to not move my jaw to articulate that consonant to the right vowel, but then I did move my jaw and it didn't work out and I heard how the resonance was inconsistent after I did that. That is also a successful iteration of that exercise or that phrase because you noticed it. And when you notice it and you affirm that like, yes, I wanna do this instead of doing that, you send signals to your nervous system and there's this background processing that starts to happen that is probably even more important than the actual mechanistic practice that you engage in during the week. It's like, oh, just noticing, it works when I do this, it works better when I do this. I noticed that, I affirmed it. Um, so yeah, for, for uh, the next thing, this segues right into it, um, for a singer to be able to retain and build on what they just did, they need to not only notice it, but to validate it and give themselves positive feedback about it. Negative feedback for the thing you don't want to do accomplishes nothing. It literally accomplishes nothing. It may raise your awareness that like, oh, you really don't want to do that again. And oh, see, look what happens when I do that. Um, but it's never going to teach you how to replace it with something that you actively want to do. So you will enjoy your practice sessions and your lessons a lot more if you are just noticing what's happening and giving yourself positive feedback when you do the thing you intended to do, being very curious about what's actually going on when you didn't do the thing you intended to do, and then validate, affirm, repeat when it's successful. Give yourself that positive feedback. It's not just to make yourself feel better, although I do want you to feel good and I want you to feel supported and I want you to affirm yourself, but it's just how we learn. We have the motivation to do it again. Oh, I did that and I had this amazing resonance and my voice felt free, I wanna do that again. Um, now, finally, for all of this to be working efficiently and for you to be making swift and regular progress, you need to present yourself with a manageable challenge whenever you're working on your singing, right? Not try to figure out everything all at once, focus in like a laser on the one thing you really wanna master and observe and change in your singing. Realizing that, realizing just how important it was to break things down into very manageable components was the big light bulb moment for me as a teacher. Uh, and the reason for that is that the paradigm that I was given as a voice student and then the paradigm that I taught with for years was what I will call the one hour better voice lesson paradigm and it doesn't work because we're trying to cram everything into every one hour session every single week. Um, so let's just talk about the one hour better lesson paradigm. This is what I received. You might have um, been fortunate to work with some teachers who were a little bit more creative about it, but the expectation, and still when somebody comes to me for a first lesson, they might be a little bit surprised that this isn't necessarily how it works, but you come to your lesson, you do some warm up slash technique exercises, and then whatever comes up in those exercises um, that isn't working well, right, whatever issues present themselves, 
then we focus in on the things that aren't working and we try to fix the things that aren't working. And then it's time to study some repertoire. And the same thing, you don't talk about the things that are going well, you home in on every aspect of it that isn't going quite as well as you want it to. And as a teacher, when, especially when I was first starting out, I just thought it was my job to give every student as much content and information as I possibly could within the space of an hour. One-on-one -on -one time is expensive, um, whether it's a voice lesson or something else. And I knew that my students really wanted to get as much value out of that hour with me as they could, and I wanted to give it to them. And so I would try to teach them everything about technique and musicianship and acting and performance practice and uh, what to expect in an audition every single time they showed up. And I would feel bad if I hadn't touched on everything every single time they showed up. Um, and so this is where the job satisfaction comes in again because it's impossible. I can't teach you everything I know in the space of an hour and you can't learn everything that I know in the space of an hour. And so I'm never gonna be able to give myself the positive feedback that like, that was a kick-ass lesson and I did my job really, really well because what they would leave and I think, oh, if only we had time to do this more, if only we had time to do that more. Um, the one hour lesson, the one hour better lesson paradigm doesn't work. Um, and even if you're seeing somebody week after week after week and they are practicing hard and you're trying to build on these concepts, if you think that you've got to touch on everything that isn't working well, in every single lesson, progress is just not going to be nearly as fast as it could be otherwise. Um, so what am I doing differently? Well, um, a few different things, because not the same, different people are going to learn at different rates and different singers are at different points in their experience. Um, so if they have all the time and resources in the world and they can hang out with me as much as they want. Uh, what I'm offering now is a program called Vocal Elementals. It is a longer term six to eight month program and it breaks down into 24 lesson modules that cover specific topics in vocal technique. And so it proceeds like a um, independent study one-on-one uh, -on -one tutorial because it gets customized to the interests and needs of each singer, depending on how much experience they have, how much knowledge they already have, and most important, what do they want to do? Are they pursuing um, Are they pursuing singing because they want to be a really good ensemble singer and participate in a chorus? Are they taking lessons because they want to improve their classical singing in order to pursue an opera career? Are they taking lessons because they want to improve their understanding of singing so that they can be a better singer-songwriter and perform better with whatever band they're performing with. Um, how we're going to focus in on all of the topics and vocal pedagogy over the course of their program is going to be different from singer to singer, but the fundamentals are always the same. There is breathing, there is phonation, there is articulation, there is resonance, and there is everything we need to integrate to be able to do all these, these things together condition the instrument. Remember I, I uh, mentioned at the beginning that, uh, and it's very near and dear to my heart, the importance of being able to condition your body for peak performance in singing, just as an athlete would condition their body for peak performance in whatever uh, sport they want to play. Um, and these fundamentals are going to be the same for every singer. So there is a one-on-one -on -one lesson element to it. We meet every week, but each lesson is topical. We go over the topic and then they get homework. They get videos to watch and things to read and specific exercises to do so that they can master whatever the topic of the week is. And it gives me the opportunity to focus on absolutely everything, including a lot of things that I was never really able to touch on before I was working in this way. For example, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to take a well-coordinated inhalation. And while a voice teacher may include some discussion of how to inhale, um, after a certain point, we just figure, oh, you know how to inhale. And I would just like, you'd point out to the student like, oh, you're taking a shallow gaspy inhalation there. Don't do that. Take the deep, low breath that you worked on. And then you just go on to the next thing. But 
if you really take the time to spend an entire lesson on how to inhale and also include some stretches and self myofascial release exercises so that you can improve range of motion for your rib cage, improve range of motion for your abdominal area so that you are capable of taking a more intentional expansive breath. Um, and just spending one week to taking one week out of your life to explore inhalation so that you really feel like you've got a handle on that. Then you're going to be able to reference everything that you studied and learned in that week. The next time something comes up and you find yourself, you know, taking maybe a shallow or a gaspier breath than you meant to, you've got all these resources and exercises you can go back to. And also you're going to notice, you're going to observe for yourself and validate for yourself what the difference is when you take a well-coordinated inhalation uh, versus a habitual inhalation because you haven't fully habituated whatever the coordination is that, that you want for that. Um, so I've really enjoyed working with singers for a longer term customized approach where I don't have to even teach them everything in that one hour lesson because I know that they're going to have all of these other resources if they want to learn more about the anatomy involved, if they want to learn more about the specific techniques involved, if they want additional exercises. I'm sending them home with homework and I'm encouraging them to reach out to me and talk to me over the course of the week um, if there's anything that they need more support for. And then when they come back, we can build on that. And by the time they're done with the program, I can't promise that, that they're gonna be able to, you know, they will have mastered singing and they will be perfect. But for the most part, they know conceptually pretty much everything that I know about singing and technique. They have had some experience and ability to validate for themselves and understand for themselves in their own body, in their own voice, the usefulness of each of these things. And so then they will know if everything isn't working exactly the way that they want to, which it's an ongoing process, we're always going to be keeping building on what it is that we know and looking for new challenges. They have strategies for anything they would need to work on. And if they do need some more voice lessons or want some more voice lessons or want to come to me or another teacher or a coach, they will be able to ask much more specific questions and get much more specific resources in order to help them. Um, which brings me to uh, the next thing, which is how do I work with a student if they aren't doing this program? What do I do instead of the one hour better lesson? Well, um, in some ways, depending on how it goes, it may look to an outsider like it's a one hour better lesson because we're probably going to start with some exercises and it's probably going to involve some repertoire study. But what makes it work for me and for the student is that I take as my jumping off point what it is that they are most interested in working on. And what they are most interested in working on has to be really specific. And I will ask them when they first come in, or they may even mention when they sign up for a lesson on, on my site, what it is that they want to focus on. Um, and we narrow it down to something that we both feel like we can get some really valuable work done on this topic in this hour lesson and it could be anything it could be um it could have to do with breathing it could have to do with articulation it could have to do with harnessing expressive energy you know if they feel like oh i really have a clear idea of what i want to say with this song and who the character is but then every time i start singing it i get tripped out on the technique of it and worrying about singing the high notes uh and then we can spend the hour and every single exercise they do and everything they do with the repertoire is going to be from through this lens of how can I express myself better with this repertoire, with my understanding of my own instrument. And if that's what they start with, I can almost guarantee that they are going to be singing whatever it was that they brought in from a technical standpoint, much better have it be feeling so much more comfortable. And it's not like we won't touch on technical issues, but you know what? Coordinating, for example, again, jaw, tongue, you know, separation, just for the sake of getting good jaw, tongue separation sounds really, really boring. 
But if you have the motivation that you want to be able to sing this high sustained passage and really feel like you can just unleash all the feeling in your heart on this high sustained pass passage, and you have had an experience that lets you know that in order to do that, you're going to have to work on your tongue and jaw separation, you are going to woodshed that tongue and jaw separation. So when I see students for an a la carte lesson, I will call it, um, that's how it works. Whatever they bring, is what we work on and sometimes it's overt you know I will ask them what would make this hour really valuable for you and they'll tell me and then we'll take it from there um, or it'll just be something that we both kind of pick up on you know this would be the thing that if we can really focus on it today would be a great day to work on it uh, and then within that just going back to all of the other things that that I was saying um, noticing they may have done exactly what I demonstrated, but did they get it, right? Did they validate it for themselves? Do they understand how they did it? Did they notice what the difference was in their experience? Not just the sound, not just how it felt, but did they notice and make a connection between what they did differently and that, that how that resulted in them performing differently? Because they need to notice it. They need to notice it if they're gonna be able to go and then reinforce it and repeat it uh, and really own that insight that they just spent a lot of money on to take a one hour voice lesson with me for. Um, yeah, are they validating it? Are they giving themselves positive feedback? And again, most importantly, are we narrowing things down to something that we can cover in this hour? Or are we trying to do too much at once? In my experience, and this goes for me too. I have to remind myself of my own practice about this too. We always bite off a bigger chunk than we can reasonably work on. Sometimes the thing to work on is just, how do you connect this note to this note? How do you connect this vowel to that, vo that vowel? Two notes, maybe one vowel. And you can learn a lot from just looking at that. Um, even if, you're the kind of person who's going to get like really impatient and bored looking at something under a microscope like that. There's going to be a way to keep yourself engaged and really fascinated, especially once you get the positive feedback that when you work in this way, when you don't try to do too much at once, it works and you learn and then you habituate it and you own it and you know it. Um, What else did I want to talk to all of you about? Um, taking a longer term view has really worked for me working with singers. Um, because if you want to actually teach somebody to sing who doesn't necessarily already know how to sing, then handling one thing at a time um, can just be so, so valuable. This isn't something that most teachers who are working with students in performance degree programs have the luxury of because those students can't just like stop everything and just focus on you know jaw tongue separation or inhalation for a week they've got performances to prepare for they've got juries to prepare for they've got save me from this but grades to earn um no one out there is going to care what grades you got um they're just going to really care when you're communicating beautifully but when you're in school Part of the teacher's job is to make sure that you get through whatever program you're in. And so taking the time to do this is really difficult. Although if I had my way, I would love to implement some sort of curriculum that embraced this idea everywhere because, because it's true, because it works. At least um, maybe that's my own survivorship bias, but it's working in my studio. It really works for me. Uh, and then when somebody comes for a lesson, um, just Focus on what it is that they can actually learn in that hour. Um, a solid pedagogy isn't just something that helps a good singer get better. And I think this is one of the things that can be so confusing about these elite performance degree programs because you have to be really good already to get in there. And then once you're there, I think the expectation is that like, oh, we're not going to focus on the fundamentals. You already know the fundamentals. We're going to focus on polishing you. 
But the thing is, I had no technique at all when I got into grad school. I was just kind of singing instinctively. Um, and also because I had been a clarinetist before I was a singer, um, not all my instincts were good and certainly not the way that my body was functioning um, as a musician because when you're playing a clarinet, like it's a rigid thing that you put your energy into. But when you're a singer, everything is always flowing, not just your voice, the vibration of your voice and your breath, but your whole body is always in a state of flow and things are going well. And so I think that I, I, was, I was kind of searching for an experience where I'd be holding a part of my body rigid and then pumping breath through it in order to produce my sound. And I could produce a pretty good sound that way, um, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't flowing, it wasn't free, it wasn't facilitating the kind of expression and musicianship that I wanted to explore with my voice, and nobody taught me to do differently. True story, seven years of grad school, my very last jury for my doctorate, not my teacher, but somebody else on faculty, wrote me a comment. I think you're manufacturing your vibrato. And I was. That's how little tech, actual technique, what I would consider technique, I had by the time I got through this program. Um, I was pulsing with my abdominal muscles ah, to make my vibrato because that's how I made vibrato on the clarinet. There's no natural vibrato on the clarinet. I started singing. I thought that I was just supposed to do that. So it was a manufactured sound that my teachers just tried to get me to make my manufactured sound better. And I was all tied up in knots and I had to you know, use a lot of effort just to get my voice to go. And so that is not what I was offered is not what I would call a solid technique. A solid technique, the gold standard is not, can you take a good singer and make them a better singer? A great coach can do that. Like I said, just having more commitment to your expressive impulses can get your technique to work better if you weren't doing that before. Get, get your voice to work better because at least you are channeling some really sincere energy through your voice. Um, which is probably the most important part of singing anyway. Um, but a well-coordinated voice is necessary to do singing on the level that I wanted to. So the gold standard for a pedagogy is can you take somebody who knows nothing? Can you take somebody who doesn't even know how to match pitch, assuming that there's nothing neurologically going on with them, they just never learned? If you've got a strong pedagogy, you can take that singer, assuming that they have the time and the resources and the motivation to invest in it. Can you take that person who doesn't know how to sing and teach them how to sing? And the thing of it is, that is important even when you're working with somebody who might be a very, very good singer, who's had maybe a lot of good instruction. Maybe they studied with a teacher who had a lot in common with them, and so they were able to learn from this teacher how to do a lot of things. But maybe this teacher always had just a very natural ability to trill, and the teacher didn't know how to teach them how to trill. And so they think, oh, I guess my voice just doesn't trill or I guess my voice just doesn't move. I can't sing sc scales because I couldn't do it. And my teacher gave up on trying to teach me. And so you could have a singer who is very, very good at many things. They may have a lot of expression, a lot of stamina, a very powerful voice, good musicianship, no flexibility. You need a teacher who understands pedag pedagogy comprehensively. Um, so in closing, what I would invite all of you again to ask yourselves is how did you get good at the things that you're good at, especially if there are things that you weren't good at before? And then take inventory. Are there, are there some things that you would like to be better at that maybe you just assumed that you couldn't do because they were just built-in features of your instrument? And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Anything that is capable to for a singer to do, assuming, again, that there's like no underlying thing, you know, neurological thing that's keeping you from doing it, which in most cases is not going on, you can learn to do those things. Um, whether it's varying your dynamics, singing higher, singing lower, singing faster, being able to sustain longer phrases on one breath, these things that you would like to be able to do, you can do them, you can learn to do them. 
but ask yourself if your concept of pedagogy includes how to do that. Because if it doesn't, then that's still something that you need. And maybe it's a fundamental thing that you just never happened to learn because your teacher didn't know how to teach it. They taught you all these other things. You figured out how to do all these other things. Maybe you've been out there singing your face off for years, but you'd still like to be able to sing longer phrases on one breath, or you'd still like to be able to figure out how to sing riffs or coloratura or trills. These are things that you can learn how to do because singing always reduces down to movement. So find somebody who actually understands how these things work. Um, approach it with an open mind. Um, try not to care so much that even though you're really, really good at these things, maybe you're just a beginner at these other things. Um, again, something that I have to deal with all the time myself in my own practice. Uh, uh, and as, as an anecdote, um, I'm, I'm working on a project uh, as a gift for somebody uh, helping to record a rock song. And I do not have nearly as much experience singing rock as I do singing opera. And my voice teacher brain wants to go, oh, I should just be able to do this because I teach rock singers. I teach people how to sing like this. I should just be able to do this. And then I try to do it and I can't do it because I have to practice it. These are skills that for me, they're fundamental skills that I understand, but I need to validate it in my own body, in my own voice if I want to be able to do it well, and I know that I'm going to be able to because that's just how it works. So have fun. Know that you can do what it is that you want to do. Um, give yourself positive feedback when, uh, when you do it well. Be very curious about what's going on when it doesn't come out the way that you want it to. And break things down into manageable chunks. That's how we learn.